Quint. Yeah. Nice having you here. It's a One pleasure. One of the fathers of the internet. One of them, anyway. Remember, there's a lot of them. That's right. But you're one of them. Very good. So when, what would you say to your students? So why is it important to study and explore the core technologies that drive today's interests? So there are several reasons. The first one is that the internet is everywhere, and if you have anything to do with uh, any kind of engineering that involves the use of the net, you should understand how it works and what, you know, what its weaknesses and what its strengths are. Uh, but looking at it as a purely engineering design, it's worth looking at because it has scaled by a factor of a million over the course of its uh, existence. And it's not often you find designs that have the ability to scale that much. And so looking at the layered structure and the functionality of the layers and the, uh, the interfaces between them uh, and the stability of those interfaces is actually an important lesson to learn. There's a price to pay for, for the layering, but uh, it has allowed for a substantial amount of expansion in the technologies of the networks underneath and the applications that go on top. And so there are lessons to be learned from understanding the design and the implementation. And so I would encourage students to look at it from both ways because they're going to live in a world which is filled with internet until something else comes along. And so what, what would you say? Is it, is it more the abstraction or the simplification of the different layers? Because to me what was, was always fascinating is that, that you really have this, this pure sense of encapsulation and abstraction that you say you build one on top of another and then it somehow works. So Well, the idea in part was that each layer would rely on the layers below for some functionality which it didn't have to implement. So for example, let's take the internet protocol layer, which by the way, was split out from the original uh, uni uh, uh, uniform TCP. So we split the IP layer out for reasons we could talk about if you wish. But the point now is this internet protocol layer uh, has some very, very simple properties. Uh, it behaves like electronic postcards. So the layers above write a postcard the to yeah. address, a from address, and uh, some content, and they push it into the IP layer. The IP layer says, I promise I will deliver the postcards most of the time. Yeah. But it doesn't guarantee to deliver yeah. them all the time. And it doesn't say anything about how it's going to do that. Yeah. Now, it turns out that the IP layer actually doesn't know how it's going to do that. It has to hand the postcard encapsulate it in some network uh, format to the next level down. And so it's relying on that level down to perform all the functions of actually moving the bits around correctly, encoding and decoding the signals and everything else. It doesn't care about that part. No. And the fact that it doesn't have to care about it means that we could put multiple different kinds of networks below the level of IP. No. IP never changes. No. And it's, it's a little, a little un incorrect because it's true that the implementation of a particular underlying, let's say, it's Ethernet. Yeah. There has to be uh, some way of getting from the Internet packet that goes into the IP layer and its encapsulation in an Ethernet frame. So there's some software that's specific to encapsulation and decapsulation well, the service access for each case. Of the layers. But, but that's only yeah. a factor of N mm -hmm. because you only have to do the implementation of the code for each case of yeah. underlying network as opposed to N squared yeah. over two translations. Yeah. So this, this uh, notion that we should do as much as we can in this layer, uh, but no more than is necessary, yeah. and allow variation below that, is, uh, is exactly the power of the Internet's layered architecture. And it, going in the other direction uh, is similar in a way. The IP layer performs this basic moving postcards around yeah. function. TCP layer, make sure they stay in order, get retransmitted if they're yeah. lost, and, and the flow and is flow controlled. But the TCP doesn't know what the applications are. Sure. And so it's the application that decides it wants a TCP connection or it wants a UDP yeah. postcard. Uh, and so the absence of knowledge of the application allows us to keep adding new applications to the net without changing the TCP, the UDP, the IP, and the lower level uh, yeah. networks. And, and all this is what you will explore in the course. So they will also see how the packets travel from A to B, that they don't necessarily travel back the same path, how the TCP mechanisms are working. And so, as you briefly named it, so, so was it thought to be combined at the beginning? So the TCP and the IP, and then 
actually what happened, that's a very interesting question, because we started with Bob Kahn and I wrote this yeah. first paper. We had in mind just this one end-to-end -end protocol with yeah. the source host through multiple networks and gateways between the nets to the destination. That yeah. was our model. And we wanted reliability, we wanted retransmission, we wanted uh, duplicate filtering and so on. About two or three years into this work, from 73 to 75, we realized that we were also going to have to support real-time communication, packetized voice, packetized video, packetized radar, and so on. Oh, so there was already voice that time? Oh yes, we were okay. experimenting with packet voice and yeah. packet video very, very early in this. Well, look, this was being done for the Defense Department. Yeah. It was going to be used for command and control. Yeah. Command and control involves voice communication and, yeah. with computers now, data communication with video. Yeah. So it had to support all of that, and we were confident that we could make it do that. I mean, you can packetize anything you can yeah, digitize. Sure. Yeah. But it turns out that TCP has this property that it really wants to deliver everything in order, yeah. and it doesn't want to lose anything. Yeah. Well, imagine for a moment that you're trying to do a voice communication, and a packet gets lost. It takes time to retransmit the packet. Yeah. Then you can't play the speech out until that packet shows up, which means you introduce lo longer and longer latency yeah. as packet loss occurs until finally you're talking to somebody on Mars. Well, in command and control situations, real-time interaction is very important. Yeah. So we decided that we would split the IP functionality of TCP out. Okay. We, so that's just pure packet yeah. carriage, and it's it's low latency, because yeah. there's no attempt to retransmit at the IP layer. Yeah. We put the user datagram protocol adjacent to TCP yeah. and said, okay, if you want low latency, go down the UDP path. And, uh, and But it's lossy. It's yeah. potentially lossy. So in a voice communication, if you lose a packet, it sometimes comes out as a pop or a click yeah. or something. And the other party might say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, please yeah. say it again. But the, the retransmission is done in the context of the conversation. The latency has not in, increased. Yeah. So uh, that's why we, we split that layer out. It was a strong argument about real-time communication that said we had to support both things. Uh, and so how many computers did you have in mind at the beginning? So because the starting there was four computers, if I'm, if I'm right? Well, it, well so. I... Actually, when we started the internet design work was 1973. This was four years after we turned the ARPANET on. Okay. So by the time 73 was around, we probably had 50 or 60 or maybe even 100 computers were involved, uh, but not, you know, 4 billion. And how, how is it seeing like that? Well, that yeah, the, it went, the old designs were, were so great that they are still running. Uh, so the, uh, when we did, we did some calculations yeah. to try to figure out, you know, how many addresses, how many destinations yeah. would we need. And so we said, um, we were thinking globally at the time, because we knew the military would have to operate anywhere yeah. on, on the planet. And so uh, that's why the address space is not nationally oriented. It's yeah. not like the telephone system. Yeah. We figured the, the Defense Department had to be able to operate wherever it had to go, and it didn't, couldn't possibly have to get permission from the, yeah. the target country, especially if you're invading that country yeah. and responding to sure, it. Yeah. So, I mean, that, you, you don't say, excuse me, am I allowed to invade you? That's not how this works. Yeah. So we said it's purely topo topological. So the first question we asked was, how many networks, no, we said, uh, yes, how many networks will there be per country? Yeah. We had just finished building the ARPANET, and that was not an inexpensive thing, so we thought, well, maybe there'll be two per country, just because there should be some competition. Yeah. And then we said, how many countries are there? And we didn't know, and we didn't have Google to ask, so we guessed at 128, this yeah. was in 1973. Yeah. Now there's 193 countries. Yeah. So then we said, how many computers per country, or per network, rather? Yeah. And there, at the time, most of the computers were big, uh, expensive machines that were in air-conditioned buildings, and they didn't move around. But we said, well, maybe 16 million, yeah. because that's 24 bits. Yeah. And the 128 times 2 is 256, so that's 8 bits plus 24 is 32 bits of address space. Oh, cool. And if we could densely populate yeah. the addresses, it's 4.3 billion terminations. Yeah. It sounded like enough to do an experiment. Yeah. And I thought that the, if the experiments worked for Internet, that we would then do a production design. Yeah. That's ex not what happened. What happened is that it escaped out of the research environment into the public around 1989 
And so we've been running the IP version 4 design for all this time, since 1983. In 96, we realized that we were going to run out of address space because of the yeah. proliferation of, of computing yeah. devices, ethernets, and so on. And so we developed IP version 6, 128 bits of address space. And for the last 20 years, we've been trying to get everybody to implement that. Yeah. We're slowly getting there, and there is evidence of significant penetration now, especially with mobile smartphones, because they're using what's called LTE, yeah. uh, which is long-term evolution. evolution. And most of them are using IPv6 addresses yeah. rather than IPv4. So uh, with the Internet of Things coming along, I think there will be pressure uh, in the manufacturing and Internet service provider community to make sure V6 is available. Even though we have, like in Asia, we already have like NATs and net cascaded NATs even, I, so yes. related all the stuff. So if people want to stay with V4, they will still find ways. But you would say like IPv6 is, is well designed and so it, it should be and really it works. Out. And it works. I mean, we, yeah. have, we run v4 and v6 at Google yeah. for our applications, for example. Yeah. The reason it's important is that cascaded NATs have some very, they're very fragile. The debugging problems is hard. End-to-end -end crypto is sometimes yeah. a, a problem. Yeah. And if you want this kind of strong protection, then yeah. you really want to have a, a, an end-to-end -end path which yeah. does not involve network address translation. Yeah. We never wanted at NATs. I mean, that yeah. was not something that was designed into the system. Sure. Neither were firewalls, interestingly enough. Yeah. And although the firewalls are helpful, they are not the solution to everything because you can walk around the firewall and infect the machines that are inside a corporate network, for example. Yeah. And we have evidence that that happens. So, uh, so uh, more and more, I am convinced that the original model of host on the internet was that it had to protect itself. Yeah. It had to decide whether it would or would not communicate yeah. with some other host anywhere yeah. on the internet. We have to go back to that rather primitive uh, view yeah. because there are too many ways for uh, parties to get access to something mm -hmm. despite the perimeter defense of the firewalls. Yeah. Okay. And so security was was more a, a topic like seeing, okay, each chose is autonomous and has to take care of its own security and... Well, in fact, uh, I mean, we, we were thinking about security, even though many people imagine we weren't. Remember, we were doing this for the Defense Department. Uh, so we had, in fact, a whole project uh, that developed packetized crypto very early in the mid-1970s. But some of that work was classified because mm -hmm. of the equipment that we were using, so I couldn't explain that yeah. to most of the people who were doing work. Yeah on the net building applications. But the idea there was to have link level encryption, which would uh, deal with the traffic uh, analysis or try to, try to deal with traffic analysis. Uh, and then higher level end-to-end -end crypto. And packetized crypto is tricky because you have to be able to decrypt out of order if you really want this to, to be. And that's a non-trivial step compared to the usual point-to-point -point link encryptors that we were accustomed to. Uh, so there was some work involved in that. The, the uh, protocols, including RFC 1108, spoke about how do we do crypto. Uh, it didn't speak to the specific key generation and key management yeah. mechanisms because there were actually a variety of, of different choices. Yeah. The early days, we would have key distribution systems, which would distribute symmetric keys. Yeah. Now, of course, we have public key crypto, and you can use that for key distribution. Ironically, the public key crypto idea was published around 1976 by uh, uh, Marty Hellman and Whitfield Diffie, yeah. who were my colleagues at Stanford. Okay. The trouble is that there was no implementation. It was just this yeah. great idea. Yeah. And then uh, some years later, maybe two or three years later, uh, the RSA algorithms come and some of the other Diffie-Hellman yeah. exchanges. But by that time, we're basically standardizing the internet implementation so we can get it out there. Yeah. And so it didn't get the chance to make use of public key crypto incorporated into the architecture at the early stages. But it's retrofittable. Yeah. And of course, people are using this all the time with HTTPS, for yeah. example. Yeah. So, so there's lots that we can still do to the internet to improve its ability to resist various forms of attack, uh, to, to deal with uh, you know, like denial of service attacks or attacks against operating systems. And most of the big bad problems that happen in the net are not down at the network router level. They're up at the applications with operating systems that aren't protecting themselves. Right. Which is why I had always thought, even in the beginning, that host computers on this internet thing would have to be protecting themselves by saying, I won't talk to you if I don't believe you're an appropriate party, so please authenticate strongly. 
And one way to do that is say, I have a key that you have, that means I must be okay. Yeah. Unless I broke the code or stole the key. Yeah. Wow, so, so really cool. So yeah, so if you, if you want to know about the, the things we were talking about and more things, take part in the course. Thanks that sounds so very like a really much. good idea. Cool. It's a real pleasure. Pleasure. Good luck.